years. More like an ex-girlfriend. Guy doesn't know when to quit. Welcome to the club. You get used to it. It's like a Raccoon City reunion. There are a few games that have given me more mixed feelings than Resident Evil 6. On one hand, it has one of the best combat systems for a third-person shooter outside of Vanquish. However, for a good portion of the campaigns, the level design doesn't work with the system. It likes to work against it. As well, the game does a terrible job of explaining how this combat system works. It's a game that took the action-focused approach of RE4 and 5 and pushed it as far as it could go. Save for a few short instances, the horror is all but non-existent. It's a game that has major pacing issues, something the series has frequently excelled at. Cutting anywhere from 25 to 30% of the game's 20 hours to beat the four campaigns would have done wonders for RE6. It's a game that has some of the worst excesses of the 7th generation, the Wii, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360 generation, a time when Japanese devs were trying to implement more Western design trends. There is something really fun and great buried in here, it's just filled with excess. It's a combat system I'm surprised Capcom hasn't really taken to a spin-off title or a different IP. There's something here even after all these years later is worth digging through with this combat system. So let's dig into this very divisive title in the franchise. Oh, and this logo for the game totally looks like a giraffe getting a blowjob. So what led to Resident Evil 6 coming to be? Resident Evil 5, released in early 2009, sold like gangbusters. It was the best-selling Capcom title for years, until March 2018 when it was surpassed by Monster Hunter World. So the series would continue in that direction, but more bombastic. They used the term dramatic horror for the approach they were taking, whatever the hell that means. Heading the project here was the director of Resident Evil Outbreak 1 and 2. Now that does seem a bit odd given how those games were, but from the co-op side of things, it does make sense, as they were continuing with the co-op approach from RE5. At the time, this was the largest production ever for a Capcom game. The four campaigns are ways of targeting various audiences, from old school fans to newer players. They were going for mass market appeal here that include the Call of Duty audience, an audience that many were trying to go after during this time frame. We'll get back to that later. And this being the largest production ever at the time for Capcom, it sure does show with the presentation. This is the MT framework getting pushed to its limit, which still looks great. Some of the textures, not so much, but the models, fantastic. So what made the combat system so great that I talked about during the intro? To begin with, let's look how it differs from its past titles. In RE4 and 5, you have to stand still while shooting. You have some context prompts for dodging, some melee options when they are staggered. These work well for how those games are made. RE6 ups the ante. You can move and shoot at the same time, but what else can you do? Well, you could jump back to the ground. You could dive left, right, slide forward, roll forward, duck. When you dive around, you could stay on the ground, move around on the ground, roll around on the ground. Sprint, sprint slide, sprint attacks. You could hit them with a melee hit at any time. You could do a quick shot for a stagger. And once enemies are staggered, you have more options. You could stagger them more for a devastating melee. Chris's coup de grace is one of my favorites. And of course, these melee attacks depend on where you're standing in regards to the enemy, from front or behind. You could also parry at the right time. So we have far more options here in the past. That's great, but does it flow well together? Well, absolutely. That's the key in these kind of games. The chances of doing what you don't want the game to do gets higher. However, save for a few instances that instead of sprinting, my character would jump over a surface, that was about it. Even getting to cover, which is something I rarely use, feels good as well. So once you get into this flow with the combat, there's nothing quite like doing quick shots, some melee attacks, rolling to dodge, rolling on the ground and getting some shots off. It's a system that's to be commended. It's just too bad a vast majority of the game works against it, which we'll touch upon later in the campaigns. It's a third-person combat system that outside of Vanquish, which was helmed by Shinji Mikami, a notable name of past RE titles, is top of its class. Remember, at this time, cover shooters were still quite popular. And to note, RE4 did help set that foundation that many Western studios would copy for years. It also just goes to show how the Japanese are simply better at making more engaging, deep combat systems. So as great as the combat system is here, the game does next to nothing to convey this. And you want to learn, because while we do get ammo, if you're just relying on your guns, you're going to be strapped for ammo quite quickly. I'm all for experimentation, trying things out and learning on that front, but the game really should give you an overview of the fundamentals. You could just have a separate tutorial section for this. I know plenty of games have moved away from this instead implementing it into the game itself, but this would have done wonders here. At the beginning, it gives you a tutorial with the more basic movements. Oh, and quick shot. But it was really going to YouTube and reading up on how it works that I discover how much depth there was in this combat system. I featured this clip back in my Deathloop review, but it feels relevant here. This is what I'm saying, though, about uh, 
AAA games? Is there like, hey, press WASD to move forward and move uh, sideways? And you're like, I got that part. Then they're like, the temporal anomaly is something that you can access via your crafting menu. If you get 17 prismatic shards, you can craft a temporal anomaly trinket that allows you to interface with the rift realm. And you're like, okay, that that one I could have used like a little stepwise introduction to. Now there is a price to pay to these kind of melee attacks, and that's where the stamina system comes into play. There's a bit of inventory management here in RE6, but the stamina is the main resource management. Although I have to mention it's odd that sprinting doesn't drain any of your stamina. Which is a nice change since so many games let you sprint for like 5 seconds before your character is winded. So knowing and keeping an eye on it for when you're doing your sprint attacks, your stunning enemies, melee attacks, it's something you always have to be aware of. It's something I got much better as the game progressed forward. Where at the beginning of the game getting a feel for it, it was easy to get fatigued. Well, in that case, if you're lying on the ground, you can recover it quite a bit faster. Again, the game doesn't really explain any of this to you, but I had to go to YouTube to get a better understanding of what was available here. And if you do check the game out, I'd recommend the same thing. There's just so many layers to this system that works really well, and when the game builds around it, it's great. Now, as great as this combat system is, you need good enemies to make the most out of it, and RE6 mostly delivers here. There's quite a bit of enemy variety here, varying from those with guns and those without guns. And those with guns, the game builds around the combat system for it. They don't just fire straight at you, there will be a delay or they'll do a sweeping arc with their shots. So while there is cover, you don't really need to rely on it. It's much more fun to dodge, hit the ground, get a few shots in before finishing them off with a melee attack. You may want to grab some cover just to catch a breather and plan your next move going forward. Otherwise, playing this like a standard cover shooter is just boring. You're not making any good usage of the combat system and you're not exactly blessed with tons of ammo. There's a good amount of variety of enemies and strategies to use here, and the game does a good job of mixing and matching them throughout the playthroughs. Leon's campaign mostly keeps it to enemy without guns, while the Chris campaign and onward will have a mixture of enemies with guns and those without. So while the combat system is great and the enemies complement the system well, the issue is the game is more interested in flashy set pieces than letting the combat shine. There are some great cases of it where you need to hold out for a few minutes while enemies approach. That's a great use of it. Areas with plenty of verticality and options of approach, awesome stuff. Sadly, RE6 likes to pad out your playthrough with turret sections, chase sequences, and other common tropes for the cinema game approach. This is something that really ramped up during this generation of games, and sadly still lingers. It's a shame because there are bits where the game does a good job of pacing things out with slower sections, but again stuffs the game with more and more explosions and set pieces. With that, let's get into the campaigns proper, so spoiler warning for stuff coming ahead. I mentioned earlier that RE6 really has major pacing issues. This is something the series hasn't really struggled with. To me, Resident Evil 4 is one of the gold standards in the industry of how to pace a game. RE5, while not the same level, still is well paced. Here on the other hand, it's all over the place. Give or take about 20 hours to complete all four of these campaigns. But if you trim the fat, cut 20 to 30%, the game would be much better for it. Turret sections, chase sequences, if you cut a large portion of these, the game would be much better and saves a lot of time. Another issue comes from the structure of the campaigns. One nice thing about the four campaigns is the overlap between them. You'll run to the others during your time. You'll see how they ended up in the same place at the same time from their perspective. Some moments will have you play from a different point as well. For example, in Chris's campaign, you'll provide cover for Sherry and Jake from above. In Jake's campaign, you'll get to play that section from the ground level. That's good stuff. However, there are other points where you're just playing the exact same portion as before, just as a different character. For example, when Chris and Piers meet with Jake and Sherry, the large battle in the street that ensures is the same. It would have been nice to have the option of just skipping these sections. Cutting this would have helped the pacing reduce that playtime that simply runs too long. There's also issues of later game encounters with enemies that just won't die and these could have greatly been chopped down as well. It's good that they're showing that, okay, these things take a long time to go down. But there was a number of times where I was rolling my eyes going, they're still not fucking dead? Come on already. So these four campaigns do have different feels for them. Leon and Helena's is more in line with RE4 and 5. Chris and Piers is the campaign going for the Call of Duty audience. Jake and Sherry is somewhere in between the two, with some more stealth focus and variety. Ada is like the separate ways equivalent from RE4. Now while this game is co-op, for this video I didn't get any footage of it, it's just easier to get footage as solo play. After the issues of Sheva's AI in 5, Capcom just makes your AI partner here on Killable. As well, you don't have to worry about inventory management with them or ammo. This is a fine compromise with the heavier action focus. There's a joke I know amongst the RE community that if it ain't long, it's wrong, which is pretty much the reasons for everything happening here. So I did a poll to get a sense of what people felt the best campaigns were. Leon and Helena won by a wide stretch, although it was interesting to read the comments. Some felt Chris's campaign was the best for the combat system. Jake and Sherry had the middle ground and the best dynamic between the two partners. 
Some point out that Leon's campaign was the best because it was also the first one. And to me here, I straight up found Jake and Sherry's the most enjoyable. While it does have some iffy sections, it does have the best character dynamic. So the way Resident Evil 6 goes about telling its plot is... a lot of issues with it. So in past titles, there was always notes that you could find around to get a sense of what's going on, and they sort of use the same system here. However, you have to find these serpent emblems throughout the levels. And to be honest, I kind of sucked at finding a good portion of them. And they are a nice way to help slow things down to get to explore, but most of the game being go, 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 it can be pretty easy to miss them. So at the end, I had to go in a wiki to go through the notes that come from these. And if you want to get all the info on the notes, RENet is what you need to use. RENet was new at the time, and obviously they wanted some form of incentive for people to sign up for it. So this is what they did. Some of these notes will have little bits between characters, notes between Sherry and Claire, Sheva reaching out to peers, some background about things. Although, jack shit about Jill, Barry, or Rebecca. The plot in the game itself is pretty bare bones and doesn't give you a ton of context in-game, although more is kept until Ada's bit where everything more or less comes together. And even with that, it seems like most of the lore in the story here has been pushed aside since then, so who knows if any of this will even pop up again. Mr. President! The first campaign is Leon and Helena, which is most akin to RE4 and RE5. Here we have two members from Critical Role, voice acting veterans Matt Mercer and Laura Bailey. It's a bit odd that they got Leon as a different voice compared to Chris and Hunnigan, who have their previous actors return. I'm guessing this is due to the time difference and making a more grim approach for him. That said, Leon still makes his wisecracks, although Helena doesn't really play off of them. A lot of his remarks are met with silence. So what's so special about this church? You have some sins to confess? It's hard to explain. Helena is fine as a character, but nothing overly noteworthy. Things get pretty frustrating here with the plot. Helena keeps stringing Leon along, saying, Let's go here, Leon. It's easier to show than tell. I'm getting kind of tired of you stringing me along. Are you going to fill me in here or what? I will. It's just... I'm running out of time. Please, Leon. Bear with me a little longer. I mean, come on, Helena. Leon has seen some shit. I think he's more inclined to listen to you. Granted, that does take away from the drama, right, if she just says, oh, my sister was taken by Simmons, and now she's been infected by the C-Virus. Reminds me of Lost in a way. Now, I did enjoy Lost, even if it fell apart at the end, but they love to have vague conversations of he or she instead of naming that person to build up drama. It's cheap, but hey, it works. The first chapter takes quite a bit to get going. The atmosphere is much more akin to the older titles, but it works against the gameplay. It's stop and go, stop and go for a bit. So prior to doing this video, the only time I played RE6 was around its launch. I played a friend's place for a couple of hours and wasn't overly impressed. Although it's nice to hear some classical music again in Resident Evil. Once the game lets you free with open areas to take on zombies, then things start to pick up. And once you head into town, having sections of holding them off, the game gets quite good. It's where the game meshes well with its combat system. And while you're not dealing with the enemies with guns yet, they're still playing to keep you on your toes here. Plus, if you're like me, you're still getting a feel for the combat system. The cathedral does serve as a bit of a palate cleanser, one of the game's highlights is being outside the cathedral fending off enemies for a time. This section is well paced in something that a majority of the game lacks, and something that later chapters here lack as well. Just some basic environmental puzzles before heading underground, and it's here where the game stretches on with long sections of set pieces and QTEs, like dealing with the underwater creature and the objective of avoid drowning. We've managed to avoid drowning. Good job. Arriving in China is when the campaign here really begins to drag, although there are good sections like running into Sherry. Sure, it can be a bit convenient of who we run into, but to be fair, most of the objectives of each campaign will end up bringing us together to certain locations. There's more of a horror-based section where we need to find three keys to progress that feels more akin to, say, RE5. These kind of areas are mostly just in Leon's campaign, it's far and few between. And for the first time in the series, we get to see Leon and Chris cross paths over Ada Wong. Chris? Leon? 
course, with Aiden in the full, Leon's logic drops significantly. But hey, we've seen that before with him. It's a character quirk with him, not just lazy and convenient writing. Then we have the big bad of the game, Simmons. Simmons is high up in the government, getting the president killed who is going to talk about Raccoon City. It is actually Simmons who ordered the new king of Raccoon City as well. Through the notes we could find, we could learn about the family that's been through his, well, family for generations. Basically, they're the Illuminati pulling strings in the background. Although they vanished since this game, maybe they had connections with, well, the connections that were mentioned in RE7 and 8? Who knows if they'll come up again. It's Simmons who is mostly responsible for this C-Virus. And then we begin the long, long, long stretch of taking him down. From train chops, to a T-Rex form, to a giant bug. Here's that tricky bounce of making an intimidating enemy that just won't die. You want the end result to be released instead of rolling your eyes, because get ready for plenty of QTE set pieces here. That said, the fights are great, and ending with a rocket launcher is classic RE, but good lord, they could have easily cut out 30-40% to 40 of this section right here. Chris and Piers is the Call of Duty campaign. It's the one that lets the combat system shine the most. But before we get into the campaign, let's talk about this fabled Call of Duty audience. We want the Call of Duty audience was something that was said a lot during the late 2000s and the early 2010s. Yeah, I don't think any franchise benefited from it long term, outside of Call of Duty of course. But for good reason, publishers were going after this audience as it was massive. Black Ops 2, which released a month after RE6, was the biggest entertainment launch of all time until Grand Theft Auto 5 a year later. $500 million gross in its first day. 7.5 million copies were sold in the United States in its first month. Let's compare that to Resident Evil 5. This was Capcom's best-selling game until 2018 with Monster Hunter World. Resident Evil 5 by December 2017, nearly 9 years after it launched, sold 7.3 million copies of its initial run. Add about 3 million more for next-gen editions and the gold edition. So yeah, even if they're getting a fraction of the COD audience, that would mean bang for companies. So there's this perception of the Call of Duty audience, but as far as research goes, I couldn't find anything 100% concrete about it. The perception is that the COD audience consists of a number of those who buy the game yearly, and that's about it for game purchases. Maybe FIFA or Madden, that's all they stick to. So all those publishers trying to get the COD audience struggle because since you know they're playing just Call of Duty. And so many franchises over time really start to lose their way with this kind of focus. They alienate their core fan base trying to get a larger audience. Many franchises around this time at their ends were put on ice as a result. Luckily, Resident Evil would be the one that would course correct and get back to their roots with Resident Evil 7, which turned out to be the right choice commercially and critically. But let's get back to Chris's campaign here. There's still plenty of set pieces, QTEs, and turret sections that drag way too long, but there's still plenty of good usage of the combat here. Now the game brings in enemies with guns into the fold, which does switch things up. As I mentioned earlier when talking about combat, they designed in a way that you're not just going to be taking cover. You have time to move in, get your shots in, and these will be doing a sweeping arc with their shots. There's some good character moments in the Chris campaign, but the setup for it is pretty weak. We jump around a bit with time here. Chris is dealing with amnesia and PTSD. Now, I'm no expert when it comes to treatment of these kind of things, but I think throwing him into the thick of things when life or death is on the line isn't perhaps the best approach of helping him heal. I'm not sure why they didn't go for a more simple setup. Chris comes back onto the field for one more mission. Is all the setup they really needed to do. After all, he killed Wesker in the previous game. Maybe he could have moved behind the scenes in the BSAA, being a pencil pusher. Maybe he was getting bored and gets the call back for going into the field. Maybe he's lost a step or two, but with a team he overcomes it. Maybe he and Jill retired from the BSAA and are living out their lives together. Of course, as roommates, strictly platonic friendship. Instead, we get Chris getting hammered and dealing with post-traumatic amnesia. Listen, sweetheart, you're here to pour drinks and look pretty, so how about you shut your mouth? How about you get the hell out of my bar? You know, this is where Jill or Sheva could have come in and snap him out of it, but instead we get this Cody Rhodes lookalike Piers. Don't get me wrong, Piers is a good character, especially during the end stretch, but they easily could have brought back Jill or Sheva or both here. And the game gets over this post-traumatic amnesia pretty quickly. If you're going to do this kind of thing, just commit to it or don't bother doing it at all. Kind of like in the RE3 make with Jill at the beginning dealing with the mansion incident, but then they just brush it aside. Chapter 2 gives us the reason for how this came to be with Chris. It's a case of the game doing these big action scenes quite well in these large arenas. 
It's nice to finally see Sherry and Chris meet, even just for a brief time. Sherry Birkin, you were in Raccoon City. How do you know that? Claire. Wait, are you Chris? My sister's told me all about you. And beyond a brief mention of Claire and then the emblem notes, that's all we got to hear about Claire here. Plus, having one of these soldiers fanboy over Chris is a really funny moment. Is he always this awesome? After this large combat arena, the game does a good job of slowing things down, entering City Hall to boost up the atmosphere. Chapter 3 has a snake pursuer, but lasts just the right amount of time before getting too old, something that the rest of the game struggles with. Chapter 4 starts off great on the boat, with lots of wide open space, cover, verticality, and number of enemies to deal with. And though we do get some more annoying QTEs or ace combat sections, there are some good sections here that feel more akin to RE5 with their focus and survival. So in Chapter 5, we get the revelation between Jake and Chris, Jake being the son of Albert Wesker. You know, a good story beat could have been here with Chris stepping down and mentoring Jake to make sure he doesn't go the way of his dad. Although from what we see in Sherry's campaign, he should be fine. Tell me, we just following orders? Or was it personal? Both. Jake, please Before stop. Put a bullet Just in your put head. your gun down. Drop your Don't weapon. do this. There are more important things at stake than you and me. Everything here is leading up to Chris stepping down after this mission and letting Piers run the show, but during a great fight, Piers makes a sacrifice to save Chris, who lives to fight another day while Piers dies. It's well done, and looking back through my notes here, this campaign mostly succeeds in what it goes for, even if it could have used a less bombastic approach at various areas. If you trimmed 15-20% to 20 of it, it easily would have been my favorite. We need you, Jake. We need your blood. $50 million. What? Cash. Non-negotiable. That'll get you one pint. Overall, I found Jake and Cherry's campaign to be the most enjoyable. Because of their great dynamic, you really could have built the whole game around these two. This is Troy Baker's Jake just before you started to appear in everything, just before Last of Us and Bioshock Infinite. I know it's a bit of a meme of how much he appears in games, but hey, it's for good reason. He's good at what he does. He plays the smartass here really well. And it's nice to see Sherry return here, all grown up, and doing her part to fight bioterrorism. Note here, I did play as Sherry. In the first three campaigns, you could choose between either or. This is Jake's campaign. I want to play as a grown up Sherry kicking ass, and I did get my time with Jake in mercenaries mode. So while Jake is a smartass, Sherry is straight laced, and that dynamic works quite well. And so many writers seem to really struggle with this. So in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so of the last decade, I like to call it Marvelitis. Everyone loves to copy that Joss Whedon formula where everyone is snarky. Problem is, when everyone is snarky, it gets old really fast. Bringing up Deathloop again, that's a game where there were constant quips at each other getting really snarky, and it got really, really old. To make this work, you need to have one person be the smart aleck and one be the straight laced. And if you do have characters that are snarky that interact, you keep it short and sweet, like how I started this intro of the video with Leon and Jake together. If they were together the whole game making wise cracks at each other, it would get old quite fast. So hats off to the writers, and I don't care, TV, movie, games. If you want to have snarky quips, fine, just don't make all your characters like that. Anyways, there's a simple effective character arc with Jake. Jake is Wesker's son. Who his mother is, it's never said. It seems to indicate more that she was just a nobody, but who knows with this series. But with Jake's unique blood, a cure can be found for the C-Virus. This knowledge of his bloodline and about Wesker isn't known at first, but he learns to come to terms with it with the help of Sherry. Sherry has had many years to deal with this on her end, her father being the creator of the G-Virus. Now she's doing her part to combat bioterrorism. So with that, she helps Jake come to terms with who his father is, and how he's not his father, just like Sherry. It's very well done. And it's kind of a shame that these two haven't appeared in the series since, I wouldn't mind seeing them again. And here we have an enemy who follows us throughout the entire campaign. This isn't a new fact to us, we learned about this in Leon's campaign. I mentioned earlier one of the issues of the game is going against enemies that just take forever to go down. Well, at this point we know this pursuer isn't going to go down easily, so it works fine here with that prior knowledge. 
these sections of being pursued have its ups and downs, some great combat sections, but there's also some forced stealth sequences with it. There's one really iffy section of the game going through a snowy area finding three items, but the aftermath in the cabin is well done in building that sexual tension between the two. They risked their lives for me back in Raccoon City. I guess I'm still just trying to live up to their example. Never giving up. No matter the odds. Unfortunately, this campaign has a couple of issues of losing in a cutscene to drive the plot forward. One of them is okay, since it's the pursuer who takes us down, but another one has you captured by just basic enemies. I've easily taken more of these down in fights. Come on, you two. There's a lot of great bonding between the two with this dynamic, and again, that sexual tension is well done. So much so that at the very end of the campaign, I was yelling kiss damn it at the screen at this moment, but instead they went for hand holding. Plus imagine if these two had a kid, that would be one badass bloodline. Sherry can heal her wounds with the remains of the G-Virus in her. And Jake with his bloodline, forget Leon Chris, you should get Jake to continue the Redfield bloodline. Plus having Wesker's son to continue the Redfield bloodline would be some pretty funny way of getting revenge. Jake Muir, you need to fuck my sister. Give me an egg. Hurry! Who knows, maybe a future RE title will have Jake and Sherry have a kid who ends up teaming up with Rose Winters or going against her. This is Piers Nivens. Ada Wong is moving south towards the military port. Advising all personnel to be on the alert. It's like a Raccoon City reunion. Ada's campaign is the shortest, and I'd call the weakest, and looking at the polls, that seems to be the common consensus. It's more crossing over the other campaigns, with fewer bits that are just exclusive to her. There are good moments, and does have the feel of her separate ways campaign of RE4. It's also at this point that I was ready for the game to be done, which I think also helps with the perception of her campaign. But Ada plays a major role in the story with Simmons here, and all the events that happen in RE6. So you're this man Simmons, a man of great wealth, power, influence. Ada Wong, a woman that you're infatuated with, leaves you. So what do you do? Do you try to move on with your life? Do you try to win her back? Or do you do research to create a virus to make a clone of her? If Helen of Troy was the face that launched a thousand ships, Ada Wong is the face that launched 12,235 experiments. These were the number of experiments that were required to make the clone of Ada Wong. Along the way, this led to off strains of the various enemies and other creatures we come across in RE6 with the C virus. And who was the experiment successful with? Well, it was Carla, the leader of the C-Virus project, which is great irony in seeing how that ended up being her. So the two Adas we see, red and black, is the real Ada, the other Ada is Carla, or Feta. So no, Ada wasn't making fashion changes on the regular. There you go, the game's plot was caused by, if it ain't Wong, it's wrong, and a man whose infatuation with Ada Wong puts Leon's to shame. The first chapter on the submarine is exclusive just to Ada, and does set events for later. You have the option to stealth your way through for a bit, which works well, but if you get spotted, you could deal with it. The game doesn't punish you for it. You'll also be staring at Ada's butt plenty with all this vent crawling that you have to do. There's a section here of making an image of a puzzle that's actually like a puzzle from the older games. Chapter 2 sees how we catch up with Leon in the cathedral, but first going through a section which feels more on pace and change-ups of Resident Evil 4, and even a few environmental-based puzzles to the ebbs and flows here. And then we get to bits that we've already played before, but now just from Ada's perspective. But there's no real difference, so it would have been nice if we could have just skipped this, and would have really helped with the pacing. However, in Chapter 3 when we're in China, we get a good intersecting bit where we're up sniping for Jake and Sherry, as we've seen from before when we were on the ground with them. This is what the game really needs to do the entire time instead of having some of these sections repeat with the same character in the same area. That's really evident with the last chapter with lots of set pieces of copier combat, QTEs, dealing with fucking Simmons all over again. It's a terrible way to end the campaign. It's big, it's bombastic, it's self-indulgent, it's messy, and it has flashes of brilliance where the game lets you have fun with the combat system, but so much of it gets in its own way.
A job, huh? Sure. My schedule just cleared. Due to this combat system, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the Mercs mode is a blast. Mercs mode has to be one of my favorite extra modes in any game, and this combat system was built for it. This alone is worth the price of admission. You know the drill of Mercs, number of stages, number of characters at our disposal, each with their strengths and weaknesses. This is a mode where I could fire up in pretty much any RE game and have a blast with it. And with the combat system here, it can really go all out. It just goes to show how much more the game could have been if they trimmed a large portion of the fat and just focused on this combat. <laughs> So overall, how did RE6 do? Critically, it was all over the place. May felt that the series had jumped the shark and got away from what it was all about, even more than RE4 and 5. Seeing how Capcom has treated the game in the canon since, it seems to have been swept away, unless some of these plot points come up again later. Capcom was shooting to sell 7 million for that fiscal year, putting it more in that Call of Duty sales numbers. However, they only managed to hit 5 million copies by that point. That said, the game did sell well over the years, eventually selling around 11.5 million copies and was second only to RE5. However, in the summer of 2020, RE7 would surpass both of them to be the best-selling base title. Now this is where things get a bit confusing, as Capcom notes there's differences between the base versions compared to the expanded versions or ported versions. So anyways, RE6 did sell well over the years, and it has its fans. Like I said at the beginning, fewer games have made me feel more mixed feelings on a title. Its combat system is something I love to see Capcom revisit and expand on. It could work well in the RE spin-off or another IP. Because RE6 spends so much of its time working against the system instead of working with it. With a bit of restraint and trim fatting, this game could have been so much more. It's something I'll probably fire up here and there just to play some mercs, but the thought of going through any of the campaigns again with all the blow doesn't appeal to me. There are great parts of the campaigns, don't get me wrong, but they're bogged down with so much poor pacing and bloat. It drifts really far from what Resident Evil was, to the point that this really could have been the end of the series. And before they decide on the final direction of RE7, they were briefly thinking of going with another action-heavy approach. This was a strange time when it came to Japanese game development. In the end, Capcom would get that out of their system and get Resident Evil back to its horror roots, which paid off commercially and critically. So with that as a recording, I've now covered all the mainline RE titles on this channel, in a weird fucking order I'll add. But there's still plenty more to the series, we've really just scratched the surface with what's available. There's a number of spin-offs to look into, to me this is mostly unfamiliar territory. So stick around, things are going to get interesting with what we explore on this channel with Resident Evil. Vincent. Who is this? Vincent? Who's that? Wait, am I Vincent? Vincent, you are a murderer. A murderer! 